Okay, so uh, today, April 3rd, Wednesday, 2019, Chapter 11, Valuation Without Calculation. Yep. Human uh, action. Talked a little bit about money and indirect and direct exchange. Yep. I thought it was a pretty interesting chapter. Yeah, I liked uh, the gradation of the means seemed to be like a call back to the earlier chapters where it's ordinal numbers versus mm -hmm. uh, cardinal numbers and about how people can only prefer a thing uh, in scales like I don't know I, yeah. I dug the, the example of like oh well you want 8p more than you want 1g but then you want uh, 9p more than that or like I don't know there's like yeah. It's not a simple scale. Where right, the conclusion was you can't do math like that. Right, yeah. Okay, so the gradation of the means. Mm -hmm. How is the gradation of the means similar to that of the ends? So I think, like you just said, it's all value judgment. I think so both of them are like an ends is. Uh, an individual value judgment of what it is, and the same thing with the means. I think. Yeah, you can't uh, you can't do math with them, and they're in terms of um, ordinal numbers. The preference is ranked rather mm -hmm. than um, numbered. I don't know what the term for that would be. Measured. Okay, the barter fiction of the elementary theory of value and prices. Why is it necessary to use money prices in order to engage in economic calculation? Ooh, ooh, because money is the most universally accepted trade item. Mm. And all things, by definition, can be priced in terms of money because right. they can be traded for it. So it's a unit of measurement that everyone can, can use. Uh, that is why it is necessary to use money prices to engage in economic calculation. Right, and it, I don't think they directly said it, but it's because it's fungible, as in like, you know, one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin versus like one pig doesn't necessarily equal one pig. Mm. That's a good point. Yeah, that's one of the, important properties of money. Mm -hmm. Although not all money is as fungible as Bitcoin, like tobacco right. in the early days was, uh, depending how, on what scale of time you're using, um, some tobacco was bad tobacco mm -hmm. and you try to get rid of that first. Why does the, econ the economist need to first explain the direct barter economy before analyzing the monetary economy? So it's because, uh, like the, mo you you trade goods for money, which is direct barter. Like that's what you're you're trading. Isn't that indirect barter? No, it's direct because uh, you're giving up money for a product or service. Mm. So there is no, you can't. There is no monetary economy without direct barter. Because hmm. like by definition, like you that's what I think. Then what would indirect barter be? Hmm. That's a good question. What would you say indirect barter is? With money? I would say indirect barter so if direct barter is trading one thing for the other thing that you want then indirect barter would be trading one thing and then another thing, you know, with someone else to yeah. get what you want. Um, but that sounds to me like what you do with money. You're like, I want this thing and then I want that other thing. So like, I'll sell this car so that I can get this house, but I have, I'm not trading the car for the house, I'm trading the money first. I don't know. Right. Is kinda, there a clue in the chapter here? I'm kind of skimming through. Mm, 
what you said makes sense. It's um, the monetary economy. Okay. So this assumption is necessary to understand the actual role of money. However, historically, it led many econ economists into two great errors. First, many economists believed that money was neutral and served only to facilitate the real transactions that had been studied in the imagined state of barter. So say, the economists concluded that in barter, one apple was traded for two oranges, then it was a mere afterthought to add in money, and concluded that one apple traded for one dollar and oranges traded for 50 cents. So that's a fallacy. Mm. The second great error of many economists was to suppose that items exchanged in a market were of equal value. And that right. makes sense. Um, okay. I'm not sure if I fully understand indirect exchange. I don't know either. Maybe they'll go into it yeah. some, some other time. But I think the, what this question is really getting at is underscoring the difference between direct barter, an apple for an orange, mm -hmm. versus a monetary economy, okay. where it's like, this apple is 50 cents, it's not priced in terms of oranges, it right. has a monetary value, which is a little more universal. That's really interesting, thinking about like trading pairs, mm -hmm. so... Like if some if you know you're trading you know BTC to USD mm -hmm. versus you know BCT uh, BTC to like BCH, mm -hmm. they're not always equal. They're not equal, right? right. Okay, then that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so I think we just. What are two principal errors that emerged from unsatisfactory examination of direct exchange? What were the con consequences for the understanding of money and its influence? So the two errors we just talked about, um, the first one being that, you know, just because two oranges equals an apple doesn't necessarily mean that um, an orange is one unit versus an apple is half a unit. Right. Um, and then the second one was said it. It was that money is an afterthought. The second great error of many economists was to suppose that items exchanged in the market were of equal value. Oh, that they were of equal value, right, right. Like, uh, and that, <clears throat> that is a huge mistake. I see that all the time. I still see that today, people make that mistake, where they think, oh, because I'm trading this cup of coffee um, for this pound of sugar or whatever, then the, the two are of equal value mm -hmm. to each of us. No. Right. It wouldn't, there wouldn't be an exchange if you both valued it, it equally. You mm -hmm. have to value your thing less, and the other person values your thing more for a trade to even want to happen. That's so cool to think about, because that's like really just like where value is generated, like right there. Because yes. now, like, you have your sugar that you wanted more, and they have their coffee, and, like, they're still physically the same items in the world, but there's, like, more value in the world. Yeah, right, exactly. So that's, like, a pretty extraordinary thing, I think. It's totally awesome and incredible. The, I remember this chart, uh, you probably saw this chart, from um, Macroecon where, or even just micro, any econ class, where you've got the supply and demand curve, and then the uh, surplus value yeah. on each side, where the, uh, the, person, the person values it at this much, and you value it at this much, uh -huh. you gain all of this, uh, like anywhere that the price is somewhere in here, like you're getting extra value, and then mm -hmm. they're getting extra value too, like value creation right there. Just totally out of subjective desires. It's awesome. So is money neutral? This feels like a trick question. I, I should say so. Yeah, I would think it's neutral. Money doesn't... Why, why would it be partial? 
I, I would yeah. think that would be a definition. A definition. That's what. That's what I would think, but I, <laughs> it seems too simple. I, like, right. Yeah, it, I would say money has to be neutral, or else it's not. It's not good money. Right. Does exchange imply that the goods or services involved have equal value? No. They yeah. do not have equal. They explicitly do not have equal value. Can uh, can we measure value? Well, to a degree, I think we can, like as as I just depicted. But yeah. it's not. I I don't think you can measure it because they talked about it like an intrinsic like psychic property. Mm, yeah, that's true. Like your your preference for something, you can't can't quite measure that. Mm -hmm. But I can measure my willingness to make a trade based on the price of something like oh okay you'll sell me bitcoin for four thousand dollars today i will take that trade all the way up until you know four thousand eight hundred ninety nine dollars like that will still be my preference i can measure measure that value i value well no i can i can't measure what, how much i value that right because I just I just want that trade, but I want it less if it's four thousand eight hundred ninety nine than I do at four four thousand. But I don't know how you I would. Yeah, you don't know how much less because it's or it's, it, it's it's yeah it's ordinal not cardinal. No, yeah, it's ordinal not cardinal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, fair fair enough. What can we say about the valuation of units of a homogeneous supply? Valuations of units of a homogeneous supply. So everything, every one of them is the same. Valuations of units. Right. It's still... Well, I would think that they should be equal. Well, it's still subjective. I believe, or does I mean does this um, like nine units of A is not necessarily like ten units of A isn't necessarily just one unit better than nine. Right. But I don't, I'm not sure if that's. I think that's right. It's that it's still subjective. Mm -hmm. Just because they're a homogeneous supply. Well, valuations of units, I would think like if, if it's all the same Samsung TV and it's all exactly the same, then I'm going to value any one of them as one unit. Doesn't doesn't matter. Like I want a Samsung TV. It doesn't matter which one. Mm -hmm. Valuations of units in a homogeneous supply should be all equal. Yeah. But the next one doesn't necessarily equal the, the previous one. In what way does the classical, did the classical doctrines provide a basis for Marxian theories? Is this like where he says Aristotle messed up by um, claiming that trade, that two people um, value uh, things equally if they trade them? And then right. Marx went on and tons of other economists thought that too. Because they Yeah, because they removed the subjectivity of value. Like that they remove whenever I hear Marxian theories I always think about like removing the individual and making like broad assumptions. And I think um, these doctrines made, you know, overstep their bounds in um, like the calculating the value of things saying if you know the market price is one good here then for all for all cases for all people of that class then it's worth that oh right okay yeah that's right like a first uh, this woman might value a loaf of bread more than a piece of candy but most of the population values, you know, the candy more than the loaf of bread or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Right, and then, like, I mean, they talked about, like, socialism and, like, had not having a market for the means of production. Mm. Um, and so, like, absent of that, you don't really get true prices anyway. If there's not a market for the means of production. Like, I thought it was really cool when, like, they talked about, um, so there's all these different means to achieve different ends, and some means are good for some ends, some means aren't as good for some, like, the same ends, and then there's, like, a third class where, like, the mean just can achieve, like, a certain end. Right. So, they just really talked about, like, the importance of the market and letting people decide, you know, all the different means to achieve their ends. Yes. Yeah, it um, reminds me of the Soviet car producers and and the um, problems, the economic calculation problem they had in socialism, um, where the Soviets didn't know what to price nails at, and so they would just look at whatever the price is in the U.S., and they were like, oh, well, uh, nails should be 30 cents, you know. Mm -hmm. But it didn't factor in the actual costs of production, the, the market um, for labor and all of that stuff. So their, their price should have been different. Right. And then it, things got wildly out of proportion. Uh, they weren't selling things for the right prices. They weren't charging the right prices to anyone. and mm. It all fell apart. Part three, the problem of economic calculation. Why are money prices necessary for evaluating and comparing the different alternatives and plans that serve at removing uneasiness for the acting man? So they talked about the absence uh, when, like, the case where it's not necessarily uh, necessary is like the the farmer, the very that lives a simple life, and it's very easy for a farmer to determine if. Um, you know, it's worth go going to get the wool and spinning the yarn to create a shirt. Yeah. Like, it's kind of, it's easy to determine, is this worth doing? But we live much more complex lives where, you know, you need the money system to um, determine, like, is it worth the effort yeah. to doing something? Yeah, to make a shirt yourself versus work doing something else and then trade the money for a shirt right so like yeah how do you like if your job is you know to you know, dig a ditch like how do you determine is it worth or I don't know if your job is some abstract thing like painting like is it worth you know painting this painting and like yeah because I get this much money and that can buy me this shirt something like that so money prices are necessary for evaluating and comparing different alternatives and plans that serve at removing yeah. uneasiness for acting man. Because you, you as a painter could be like, maybe I should make this sculpture, they make me a lot right. more money. So because money prices um, exist, they help you determine which where your time is best spent. Yeah, so I think the simple answer to number three would be just the complexity in our lives. Yeah. Do economic quantities imply money prices? Yeah, you can't have economic quantities. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be an economic quantity without a money price. Mm -hmm. You would just have a quantity of lumber. Four, economic calculation and the market. So there's a comment. The distinctive mark of economic calculation is that it is neither based upon nor related to anything which could be characterized as measurement. So why do exchange ratios permanently fluctuate? Because conditions are changing. Like, you can, you can only say that a person values a they make a trade that they value one that one thing greater than the thing that they're trading for. Right. In that moment, under those conditions. And then an exchange is uh, a collection of 
a bunch of different individuals that have that have changing preferences like you're talking about. Yeah. So uh, that, yeah, that is what exchange is. And and all their conditions are always changing. So uh, exchange ratios are permanently fluctuating because th everything is changing. Why do economic calculation and the estimation of the expected outcome of future action go hand in hand? Well, it's a part of the economic calculation. When you make a trade, you're looking to achieve an end in the future. Yeah. Yeah. You are expecting a better future outcome of relieving uneasiness and that factors into your economic calculation of what you're willing to trade now for the hope of a better future. What is the meaning of economic calculation for human action? How is the concept of economic calculation related to quantitative sciences of economics? What is the meaning of economic calculation for human action? Seems like an important question. Yeah, in the notes here it says, Mises says that on a macroscopic scale, natural scientists can certainly continue to believe that it makes sense to talk of length without worrying that measures with that without worrying that meter sticks themselves might change their size unpredictably. Yet this is precisely the problem with economic calculation. Money prices aren't a measure of subjective value because money, pri money itself is an economic good, subject to changing preferences and diminishing marginal utility as one acquires more units of it. Hmm. So, it seems like it's an imperfect science, but it's like what we got. Yeah, I think that's the bottom line. I, I remember in the chapter they talked about, you know, like, perhaps in the future, you know, physicists might discover something at the micro level um, but that doesn't change geometry um, and it doesn't uh, like humans are on a molar scale so um, like it's imperfect but it's like what we kind of just use mm -hmm. this, um, this sentence sticks out to me even though they are malleable, unlike, say, a chemist's... Uh, sorry, I should back up and just read the whole paragraph here. The, the money prices established in a market are not measurements of value. They are historical facts, recording the ratio at which two items, the money good and some other good or service, exchanged in the past. Even though they are malleable, unlike, say, a chemist's belief in the fixed nature of the charge of an electron, Market prices still provide a guide to future action. Without them, all of the subsidiary concepts in accounting, capital and income, profit and loss, spending and saving, cost and yield, would be metaphorical. Mm -hmm. So to the question, what is the meaning of economic calculation for human action? It's the only tool that we've got for determining if we're doing the right thing to achieve the ends we want to achieve. Right. So it's, it's how human action is determined. Mm -hmm. And how is it related to the quantitative 
sciences of economics? Well, I guess through uh, an attempt at measuring income, loss, right. spending. Right, so saving. that's kind of interesting. So you would think like income is like, you know, I made $500. Like that's, so that's a definite, but it's. But $500 but, itself is changing. Right, like what is $500 conceptually, you know, that. Five hundred dollars could be a, mean a lot more to me tomorrow than it did today. Right. <laughs> so it's like these hard, you know, quantitative things like sciences that, like, you know, people will say with absolute certainty, like profit minus like cost or you know revenue minus cost equals profit. But it's on a shaky foundation. Yeah, because uh, your your measurement of value is itself changing because it's also an economic good. So you're just choosing a thing to price yeah. things in. And it seems to be the best one. Money, universally accepted. Yeah. But it's all, it's moving. But I could definitely see someone like making the error of like being so set on, like, because there's like hardcore, like arithmetic, like provable on that top layer. Well, like, this economic calculation speaks to, like, the layer underneath. Well, I believe people are making that error all over the world right now based on fiat money. <clears throat> but I, the way I perceive it, they're making a mistake by pricing their profits in dollars or yen, whereas they need to be pricing their dollars in bitcoins or, or, something, or something else that's not as moving. Like, um, I know it seems like Bitcoin is, is moving more, and maybe maybe it is. But yeah, I'd say it's definitely moving more than fiat currently. Yeah. I mean, it, it is. Then again, it has a fixed supply, and the, the fiats don't. The, the fiats are, you know, if I'm pricing my um, profits in terms of, um, you know, grains of, of rice, but then I'm also producing a ton. There's a inflation in terms of yeah. grains of rice in the world. Right. Then I'm losing, even though like, oh, I, I profited this much this year. Mm -hmm. It's better to price your profits in terms of things that don't have a changing supply. Right. But Bitcoin has a changing supply. It does have a, yeah, it has a predictable right. uh, supply though. Yeah. It, a court technically, like if you believe the government CPI number, it, Bitcoin has more inflation right now than. Oh really? Well, I think That's it's interesting. Bitcoin has like a two point five percent annual inflation right now, mm -hmm. um, and then the next happening, it's going to be one point eight. Mm. So it that'll be a big thing because, like the you know the Fed's goal is to keep inflation at two percent. Mm -hmm. Right, they just change it to be averaging two percent mm -hmm. because they know they're gonna go over. So they, they move the yardstick a little bit. Right. Um, but yeah, that'll be interesting. And you have this money that, even with the fake inflation number, has a lower inflation rate. Well, I guess in the even in the time that this book was written, uh, most of the world used gold as the um, money standard. So even though there was fiat and, and money printing, uh, they were using gold and still the, the concepts are valid that look, gold is just another economic good, even though it's the most stable means of the, or stable way to measure um, profits and, and losses, it's still a moving target. It's, right. And I wonder if the, we'll ever have something that's totally fixed and, and universally good forever as a, as a measurement of value. Yeah, I think that's, that'd be Bitcoin. Could be. That would be really great. Well, anyway, this was fun. Next is chapter 12, the sphere of economic calculation.
Um, yeah, and then we should do 13 as well. These are very short. You want to do 12 and 13? Yeah. Okay. I, I looked ahead at chapter 13, and it's, like, super small. It's, like, a couple pages. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. And then, so that's part three. So, wow, cool. Cruising right along. This is great. We're in April. We're going to be finished this by Christmas. Yeah, I'm really starting to get into this book. Yeah, me too.